As you guys probably know, I do a lot of feedback on live streams every Sunday, and that means that I get to listen to a lot of different people's music. Now, some people are a little bit further in their musical journey, and some people are just starting out, and there's a lot of things that I hear in specifically those that are just starting out that I want to address in this video. So we're going to go over the 10 biggest mistakes that I often hear beginners make, and I'll also obviously talk about how to fix them. So here we are in the project that I have set up today. As you can hear, we have a kick and bass. And we have some synths and a vocal for later. For now, I want to start off with the kick and bass because that is where I get the most questions from beginners. Usually when I'm giving feedback, one of the things that they'll ask for is how is the kick and bass? And what I want to tell you is that in and of itself, the kick and bass doesn't really matter as much as beginners think. And to be honest, I've even heard this from experienced producers who will spend a lot of time working on their kick and bass without actually working on music. To give you an example of what I mean by that is in my productions, usually I have around like 150 to 200 sounds and the kick and bass are just two of those sounds. Not only does that mean that if I spend a lot of time working on my kick and bass, I don't get to spend that time on other sounds that are also important for the musical idea of my track, but it also means that all of those other sounds are going to cover up the details that you spend so much time working on. To me, when I start up producing, when it comes to my kick and bass, I do everything very, very simply. As you can see over here, I have a kick sample loaded in. This is a kick sample that I've previously made for one of my sample packs. So usually I just go to that sample pack, Psychedelic Drum Pack Volume 1 here. I choose a kick that I like. Obviously, I choose one that works with the key of the track that I'm working in and the BPM as well. And then I just drag that kick into the project. I do a little bit of EQing, as you can see over here. This takes maybe like 30 seconds to set up. And then I move on to the baseline, which is even easier. It's just a preset that I have here, the Sub Shifter Auto Sub Control. This is from my Psychedelic uh, Essentials Volume 3 here. For me, the name is a little bit different because I'm obviously the one that made it. But it's this preset over here. And the only thing that I have to do in this preset is set the phasing amount and set the closer amount, which maybe takes me like 10 seconds to do. So overall, I would say I get my initial kick and bass down in about two minutes of production. What I then do is I immediately move on to the rest of the track. I start writing on top of the kick and bass so that I have context to hear what my kick and bass actually needs to sound like when I actually get to work on it. Because I think the biggest hindrance to a lot of people's creativity is opening up a new project, having all of these cool ideas and then spending two hours trying to get the kick and bass to work only for you to realize that either you don't like the project or the synths that you want to put on top of it don't actually work with the type of kick and bass that you're going with. And then you have to start over again and over again. And you just have this endless cycle of not getting your ideas out because you spend a lot of time worrying about just one single element. Now, obviously, it doesn't mean that I only spend two minutes for every production on my kick and bass. For one, all of these presets and all of these kicks took many, many hours to make. There's also been a lot of iterations to the sounds. There have been a lot of different changes that I've made over the years to it, of course. And this bass patch might continue to evolve and evolve even more. But I usually do those in separate projects instead of productions. As in, I just spend a couple of hours experimenting with bass creation and implement all of that, what I learn in that process, into a new patch that I then can quickly open up and use in my actual productions. So that the time that I spend on my kick and bass is kind of separated from the actual production process. And the same is true with the kicks. All of these kicks have been made before I actually started the production. So I just drag it in and it is much quicker, much easier to making a kick from scratch. And that long process of making the kick drum and making the bass doesn't actually hinder any of the creativity that I have when I start a new production. Now the next thing that you're probably going to do is add some synth sounds. Let's add this first one over here. And you'll probably hear immediately that there is something a little bit off about this synth sound over here. It is a nice sound, don't get me wrong, but it's played in the wrong octave. And I hear this a lot when I listen to beginner productions. What will usually happen is that they either sound design a sound or they're using a preset and they don't actually listen to how the sound sounds on all different octaves. So let's do that here with this pitch control over here. What I'm going to do is I'm first of all going to turn it down an octave to see what that sounds like. Notice that we get a little bit more of a gritty texture out of it, and that is something that I like. So let's try if we can increase that effect by going down another octave. And now it's really starting to sound like the kind of synth that you would hear in a lot of Psytrance music. You get that kind of gritty fm -y tone with those nice high frequencies in there as well. And it just sounds a lot more grounded and a lot fatter than when you play it on the higher octave.
You know, it might actually surprise you, but most of the sidetrend synths that you're going to play, most of the different types of sidetrend synths that you're going to play, are actually triggered on the same register as your baseline. What that means is, let's say that we go into the bass patch over here. One of the things to keep into account is that I don't use these octave settings over here. So whatever MIDI that you send in, it's going to play that same MIDI note. It's not going to pitch it down by an octave or two, which a lot of other patches do tend to do. So keep that in mind. So if we look at the register over here, we can see that I'm playing it in the zero register here. Now this is going to change a little bit from DAW to DAW. I believe FL Studio counts it too higher. So in FL Studio it would be in G sharp two instead of G sharp zero. And your DAW may also make a difference in that. So just test out where the sub bass is going to come from and what register you get some sub bass from the sound. And then make sure that you test your synths in that register. So what that means is if we look at the MIDI over here, we can see that this is in G sharp two, minus the two octaves that we have over here gets us to G sharp zero. So now we're playing this sound and this sound in the same register. Here's another example of that same effect. Here we have the classical side trends band pass plugs. Now it sounds good, but it sounds a little bit light and it doesn't really connect with the bass line yet. Let's turn it down by a couple of octaves to see if we can fix that. Notice that we still get the nice sharp pointy feeling of the sound, but we no longer have that one initial hum that we heard when it was at the higher octave. You can hear that it has that mm, kind of sound to it. You can even see those two spikes appearing over here. And if we push it down to octaves, what we're essentially just doing is taking those spikes and pushing them to the sub bass register over here, which as you can see, we're filtering out. Now, the reason why this is the case has to do with the harmonic series and the way that the harmonics interact when you're pitching them around. What you'll notice is if I raise this up, that each of the spikes that you see in here, each of the little spikes that show up here, this one, that one, I can unfortunately not freeze it here, I think, but you can see the individual like spikes in the spectrum because they all get shifted down. They get closer together when they actually play in this area over here. Notice that at the lower octave, you get just more of those little individual spikes that make up the bigger like triangles that we see in the spectrum. What this means is that for each sound that plays, there's just more energy because there's more like sounds playing there. There's more individual sine waves making up that sound, which is what essentially harmonics are. And therefore it is going to sound a lot denser. Now, of course, not every sound is going to work with this particular register. For example, here we have acid sounds and usually I like to play my acid sounds one or two octaves above the sub bass register. So here, as you can see, the lowest one is actually in G zero here, but this main melody over here, that is basically the part that you actually hear is in G sharp one. So this one is one register above the register of the sub bass. And you can hear if I lower it a little bit more, it's going to sound a little bit too low. Now we're starting to lose the definition and the tonality of the actual sound. It is hard to actually identify which key the sound is in. So it's not a standard rule that every synth plays at the sub bass register, but most synths that you're going to interact with within side trends are going to be playing in the sub bass register. And that is how you get that nice, deep, gritty tone out of a lot of synth sounds that you're using. The next thing that I often hear beginners do is not really structuring their track. And the reason why this is a problem is because the listener of your track does not have the project in front of them. They don't know how the project looks like. They don't know what is coming up next. So you need to guide the listener into what is happening in your track. So let's take an example over here. We have been jamming with some synth sounds and let's just say that we want to add more synth sounds. What a lot of beginners do is just duplicate this over a couple of times and then they'll have a very long drop with just kick and bass continuously playing, playing, playing here for, as you can see, almost two minutes now. And this will be one of the drops of their track. Now, obviously, maybe the synths change and there's some effects here and there and maybe some drums get added here and there. But you can see there's not really a clear structure to this track here. It's just one long, big section of kick and bass. What I personally recommend to any beginner is starting like this. What you want to do is you want to identify 16 bars of kick and bass, which we have over here. And then we want to make a fill towards the end here. 
Now I see a lot of people making the fill, making it longer. So that would be something like this. What they would do is say that they want a fill of one bar. They would duplicate it over like this. I recommend against that because it actually offsets this part with respect to the structure. So what you want to do is actually take that fill and put it into the section of 16 bars. So I'm going to delete three kicks over here and four parts of the baseline. I always like to end on the kick because it nicely kind of seals the phrasing of the kick and bass. And then what we can do is we can duplicate that over. Now you have the same length of drop, but you can see that we have these little gaps over here. And this is the structure that you can start to use to play your synth sounds. So for example, say that we take the first synth that we had over here, and we're just going to place that right here. And then we'll take this support synth and maybe also start playing it here, duplicate that over to the next section, and then we'll take our asset line and play it in the next section over here. You can already see just by looking at the MIDI clips that there's a lot of structure to it. The change from this synth to this synth actually happens in the fill here, in the sense that this synth stopped playing and then when the kick hits, the asset line starts to play. And you can hear that it just feels like a very natural progression. Now there's probably a lot more that you want to do with this fill. So for example, let's say that we want to take the last part of the asset line and already introduce it a little bit earlier. We can do that. We can maybe make a slight modification here. Let's maybe do something like this. Maybe we go to three two notes over here just to make it interesting. What I also like to do often is fade out the original synth that I'm playing. So in this case, we're just going to high pass it. We'll do it like this. Go up to 10K-ish. And I also like to increase the Q sometimes. Let's see if that works now. In this case, what we can do is we can take the delay here and we can take the feedback and massively up that towards the end here as well so that we get just a longer delay tail here. And now you can hear that our fill is used as a transition from one element to the next. Now this structured manner of working actually applies to everything. So let's say that we want to add some drums to this. I'm just going to create a new track and group that. I'll make everything white here so that it's easy to follow. I've just created three tracks over here and we're going to need a closed hat, a snare and an open hat. So I'm just going to drag in three random ones here. This one might be a little bit on the long side, so I'm going to pick a different one. There we are. Let's duplicate this over. Let's du set this over here and let's set the snare to the second part. We can then duplicate this over here and you have your standard kind of side trance drum groove here. The way that you want to start using these drums is also in a structured manner. So the way that we would do that is just duplicating that over throughout the whole section. So up until here, let's have it also in here because this is also a high energy part. And let's just leave the drums out of this section so that we can go back into a little bit of a lower energy part over here. Now say that you want some differences between this segment over here and this one over here. What we could, for example, do is turn off the open hat over here. As you can see, I'm doing that in the entire section. What I don't like to do is stuff like this, where out of nowhere, instruments kind of come in. What I find much nicer sounding if there is also transition in between that. So in this case, there's this fill over here, which you already made. And you can hear that it just naturally allows for a little bit of pause. It allows the listener to catch their breath. And then we go back into it and you can hear that there's a change in the drum groove. What you'll also hear is that this synergizes very nicely with the other elements that are also following the same structure. I'm 
Another thing that this structure allows you to work with is the so-called division rule. Let's have a look at the SIN3 over here, this asset line, and let's say that we want to automate one of the parameters on it. I've already set up a macro which is tied to the filter cutoff, as you can see. The way that we can think of what this automation is supposed to do is through the division rule. What I mean by the division rule is say that you take the beginning and the end of your structure and you divide it straight in the middle. Let's do that over here. We end up right over here. So that means that we have three like points of interest, which I like to call them, and that is where the automation can change. So that is where you would make your automation points. One over here, let's start at the very highest part, and then we'll go down over eight bars up until we get to the first division, and then we go back up until we get to the end of the section. Now you can keep up dividing more and more and more, and the division rule is actually used in a lot more things like the placement of one shots and effects, but you can hear how the flow of the asset line now really works with the structure of the track. What I often hear in beginner music production is that maybe they'll do something like this, where in the first half it is all over the place, and then they say, oh, actually, you know what, I want this to rise up until here. So you get this very strange sounding like musical motif that doesn't really make sense in the whole structure of the track. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that every automation that you have should look like this. There's many more automations that you can do in particular structures. Maybe you just want a rising effect over the 16 bars. In that case, you don't even make a division. Maybe you want to make two divisions and go up and down twice. So you would do something like this over here. All you really have to do is keep in mind the structure of the track and how the energy is supposed to flow and really force yourself to initially at least work in these kind of structures. Now, if you're a beginner, at a certain point, maybe after like six, seven productions, you'll hear that it starts to sound a little bit boring. And that is where you can start to experiment with the structure once you understand the rules of structuring. There's actually a very big video that you can watch if you want to learn much more about the rules of structuring. I tried to cover the most important parts in this video, but this is not going to be like a full guide to structuring for Psytrance. So I'm just going to move on to the next point for now. But if you want to learn much more about structuring and arranging your Psytrance tracks, make sure to check out that video. The next thing that I often hear in people's Psytrance music is that they're using too few elements for the entirety of the track. Now, you may have been surprised when I said that on average, my tracks use between 150 and 200 different unique sounds, but that is for a very, very good reason. What I often hear other producers do is they'll have something like this where they have their asset line and they say, okay, I like this, let's take this and let's duplicate it over here. And then we'll just change the melody up a little bit. Maybe we'll do a few extra notes here. So they're just building out a different melody and then they'll start to play that one instead. What you'll hear is that, yes, the melody is changing, but the sound really isn't changing. We're still listening to the same thing. You can hear how, yes, the melody is different, but it doesn't really like grab your attention and do something new. So what I've done is I've added another synth sound and this is actually going to play a completely different sound as opposed to a different melody with the same sound. And now you can hear the difference. Notice that the change now sounds a lot more exciting. So now that we have this new sound, what you'll see is that in terms of main synth, if we discard this synth over here, let's actually color it differently so that we can see that this is like a supporting synth here. 
In terms of main synths, it is pretty clear that we have one main synth per section over here. One, one, and one. And what you'll often find in Sidetrance is that there's going to be, yes, a couple of synth sounds playing on top of each other, but every section is just going to have one main sound, one main idea. It can be an idea made up of multiple sounds, but in that case, there's some trickery going on with how you arrange those sounds so that they don't actually play on top of each other, but together like form one unique idea. What I'll do now is I'll quickly jump over to a different production so that I can explain a little bit better with some better examples what I actually mean by that. So here we are in a different production. As you can see, there's a lot more going on in here, so I can use a lot more examples. What you'll immediately notice is, first of all, everything is structured in parts of 16 bars. This is a 16 bar drop, this is a 16 bar drop, this is a 16 bar drop, this is a 16 bar part over here. It is not exactly like every segment is 16 bars. In fact, if I scroll up to the structure track over here, you can see that there's many different parts to it. But every drop segment, as you can see, every part in red here is 16 bars, or it is like the fill is carved out of the 16 bars that we have over here. So this total part is 16 bars from this drop segment over here to this drop segment over here, but it's part drop, part buildup, and part fill. This over here is another example. As you can see over here, we have a 16 bar part, a 16 bar part. So you would say like this is much longer than that, but this is actually 32 bars if you include the fill again. And that just means that it's two parts of 16 bars, of course. And what you'll find is that that 16 bar structure is also reflected in a lot of the sequences. So over here, we have a sequence. Over here, we have a sequence, which is 16 bars. A little bit later, we have another sequence, which is 16 bars, another sequence, which is 16 bars. You can see sequences all over the place that are 16 bars. What you also notice is that every element seems to play like very sporadically. There are a few duplicates of items over here, for example, and this one also plays over here for eight bars. This is actually a little build-up segment between two drop segments. So this is eight bars, but it's not actually a drop, so it doesn't actually really like count for a structure. So what you'll notice is that I'm not actually using a lot of the elements like all the time. I'm trying to keep the track interesting continuously by just continuously changing up the sequences that are playing. And especially the main element, the element that I want the listener to actually like focus on when they're listening to the track is consistently changing and never goes back to the same element twice. So for example, this sequence over here, which I find sounds really, really cool. This is a sequence that took me a long time to make. As you can see, it's made up of a bunch of different sounds. And you can see that throughout the rest of the track, I never really use it again, up until this point over here, where it becomes a support element and is no longer used as a main element. Now this brings us back into this project over here where I can show you what I hear a lot in beginner strikes, which is the stacking problem. What beginners will tend to do is they'll start to build up their track like this, but they'll not actually delete any of the elements. So a track of a beginner production will look something like this, where you can see for each section, it just becomes more and more and more elements. The ideas don't actually change, they're just added on top of each other. And if you also add the drums over here, you can hear what a mess this becomes if you play all of the ideas at once. You can hear that it's really hard to understand what you want the listener to listen to at this point. So that's the reason why I suggest keeping every element to one section. It keeps the track more interesting. It switches up the track more and more and more. And it allows you to combat the stacking problem that you hear with a lot of beginner tracks, where you just continuously add more and more and more stuff on top without thinking about how can I take some stuff away and make sure that the things that I'm adding actually shine through in the track, as opposed to being layered upon stuff that already is playing in the track. You can imagine it like this. If I introduce a new element to the listener, I really want the listener to hear this new element. So the old elements that they were already listening to has to get out of the way. It has to stop playing. Now, ironically enough, I think that all three of the last problems, the stacking problem, the using too few elements problem, and the using too many elements at the same time problem are all kind of part of the same idea of the same mindset. And the best way to explain how to get out of that mindset is just again to show this project over here and to just make a few observations about that project. You can again see that there's a lot of different elements. If you open up the vocals over here, we can see that there's in total 220 tracks. Not all of these tracks contain sounds, of course, 
There's a lot of helper tracks that I have over here as well, and a lot of groups and stuff like that. So we can assume that there's like 170 to 180 sounds in the project right now. And that is like actual different sounds in the production. We already looked at my philosophy for sequences, where I'm using one main element per like section of the track for my main sequences. But the same stuff is pretty much true with my one shots. And one shots are those type of sounds that you're used to make the track a little bit more interesting in a specific part. So to give you a few examples of some one shots, let's play some here. Uh, I'll start with maybe this one over here, which is a nice melodic thing. So this is, as you can hear, a melody. You would think that this would repeat constantly to kind of enforce the musical idea. But this particular melody only plays once. It plays over here. We have a few more other melodies playing with the flute. So I'm definitely using the flute more and more and more. But this unique idea over here plays once and it only plays in this part of the track. Meaning that it's going to stand out in this part of the track because no other part of the track is going to sound like it. Just in general, some other ideas for one shots are stuff like this. Nice little delayed impact over here. Uh, here we have a reversed reverb with some chords on it. And you can again see that I'm playing this fairly sporadically in the track. I'm using this five times at this point. This is one of the main one shots that I want to come through and kind of become part of the main idea of the track, of the overall story of the track. Just because I really like this particular sound, I have some more like type of these sounds over here as well. Some really cool like chord stuff, some complex sequence doing some complex stuff. So there's definitely a few one shots that repeat multiple times, but even for the ones that repeat multiple times, you can see the impact on the overall length of the track and the amount of time that they're playing versus the amount of time that they're not playing is very, very small. You see all of this stuff over here, it's not playing here. There will be a little bit of a delay tail for this one. So it's not playing here, it's not playing here. This one does not have a delay tail because it's only the reverse reverb. So here it's not playing. Here it's not playing, you never hear it over here, you'll never hear it over here, and you'll never hear it in the last part of the track either. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of things to take into account when adding sounds to the tracks. Do I not add too many sounds? Do I not add too many sounds in one place? Are the sounds that I'm actually adding fitting with the track? Am I playing the right octave? Am I working on the right sound? Everything that we have discussed up until this point is like part of the main production, and it's just putting everything in the track, getting all of your ideas into the track, and how can you make it so that all of the ideas that are in the track shine through to the listener? Up until this point, essentially the whole discussion has been about making sure that one sound doesn't cover up the other sound by just not having sounds there. There is, however, another thing that you have to take into account, and that is going to be the mix. Now, the mix is not like solving the production problems that you have, in the sense that if you have too many sounds playing at the same time, or you have too few sounds playing at the same time, where the sounds are just not interesting enough, or a sound is playing for too long, so it becomes stale and boring over time. Those things are not going to change with the mixing. You'll have to make sure that in the production stage, you're not adding too many sounds, you're not adding too few sounds. The sounds that you're adding are actually like interesting, they don't become stale over time. All of that stuff is part of the production, and once you get into the mixing stage, you really cannot do anything unless you again go back into the production and start to change things again. Talking about the mixing process though, there's a few things that I hear in beginner productions that I think are like very big mistakes. The very first thing is mixing for tracks, not mixing for a purpose. What I mean by that is mixing is the process of taking all of the sounds of your track and you have to combine them all together so that each sound has the priority that it needs to have within the track so that the listener can actually decode the single waveform that they're listening to into all of the sounds again. So instead of worrying about, okay, this is the compressor that I'm going to be using, this is the particular release time that I'm going to be using for this particular compressor that is on my kick drum, shaving off half a dB of gain reduction, whatever, whatever. What I want you to think about when you initially start mixing is just about priorities. So for example, the biggest priority in this track is going to be the kick drum. That is the main thing that we're dancing to. Then the second priority is going to be the bass line. So we want to have our bass line a little bit quieter than our kick drum, maybe like one dB, maybe even half a dB. We just want to signify to the listener, hey, you should be paying a little bit more attention to the kick drum than the bass line. Both of them are very, very important. We want you to listen to both of them, but the kick drum is going to be a little bit more important than that bass line. Then the hierarchy is kind of going to spread out as a pyramid. And what you'll find is that you're probably going to have maybe like three elements that are going to be at the third level of like importance after the kick and the bass. 
Those are going to be like your main percussions on the top part and then your synths in the middle part. Maybe there's some one shots as well. The one shot that we looked at before, something like this over here, uh, this chord thing with the reverse reverb, this one. To me, that is a very interesting and beautiful sound, so I probably want to give that a lot of priority in the mix as well. I want the listener to hear that. But of course, I have to keep thinking in the levels of priority. I don't want this one shot to overpower the kick. I don't want this one shot to overpower the bass. I don't want this one shot to overpower any of the drums, because those things are more important to the overall picture of the track. So how do you do that? How do you make sure that you can mix in these priorities? Well, you have to use the four levels of separation. We've already looked at the first level of separation, which is time separation. If a sound plays here, and then this sound plays over here, they are separated in time. In this case, they are not really separated in time because this one also plays over here. But take this sound and this sound, for example, over here. These two sounds are separated just by the fact that they're not playing on top of each other. So separation in time really is a production thing, isn't really a mixing thing, but we already take into account the mix when we start producing. We don't want to produce a mix that is unmixable. Like I said before, we don't want to stack too many elements on top of each other. We don't want our sounds to become too boring over time. Those are all things that are part of the production. So that is where separation in time comes into play. The other three forms of separation are those that you can establish in the mix. Those are separation in volume, separation in frequency, and separation in stereo width. The first two are fairly self-explanatory. If one sound is very loud and you know the sound is very quiet, they're going to be very separated and they're not really going to conflict with each other, one sound is just going to overpower the other sound. For many sounds you actually want this kind of effect, you actually want sounds to overpower other sounds and really like deliberately put some sounds in the background so that you can barely hear them. A good example of that is happening in this part of the production over here. You can see that we have two sequences. This one would be a main sequence and this one over here would be a support sequence. So you can hear over here Like a little plucky thing that just adds a little bit of extra interest to the background. Whereas this sound over here is very big, very distorted, very aggressive, very attention grabbing. And you can hear together that this sound is just plainly overpowering this sound over here, already in the production mix. What you'll also notice is that some of the important one shots kind of temporarily overpower the main sequence over here. So for example, we have a flute, uh, which is actually this guy over here. Notice how this flute really grabs your attention when it starts to play. It just plays for this little bit here where it grabs the attention. Sure, it reverbs and delays out over here, but that starts to kind of fall back behind the other sequence again. The second part of separation is going to be frequency. This is another very easy example. Say that we have the kick and bass over here. A lot of low frequencies. These two actually don't clash the kick and the bass together because they are actually time separated. That is how you mix kick and bass, making sure that one doesn't overpower the other by just simply making sure that either one or the other plays. It's of course not like that one-to-one -one in the sense that the kick plays from here to here and the bass line plays from here to here and it only plays in this gap and the kick only plays in that gap. There's a little bit of crossover between that of course but essentially we're doing a lot to make sure that they are time separated. For example when it comes to the transient of the kick the most important part of the kick this little bit over here we make sure that there's no bass playing from here and even before it what I personally like to do is make sure that the bass kind of stops playing over here in this segment so that the kick transient gets all of the space that it needs and then slowly when we get into the body of the kick towards this part over here, the bass line kind of slowly fades back in and then here the bass line really takes over and it starts to play again. When it comes to frequency separation though, the other element that you can think of are the hats and your percussions, stuff like this. The kick drum and the bass drum, as I said, mainly have their main focus in the lower frequencies but this has its focus in the higher frequencies. If we look at this part over here, this is where the main focus of the sound lies. Now you can see that there's some lower stuff going on as well. I might cut some of that out because over here it seemed a little bit too high, but you can kind of see how the main focus of the hats and the percussions are up top here, 
while the kick and bass are going to be down here in the sub bass region. The final one is the hardest to explain because it's not something that you intuitively have an idea or an ear for. Stuff like volume and frequency and time separation are very easy to explain in terms of just hearing it. But stereo with you really need a good monitor setup or a good pair of headphones to actually hear what is going on. And there are some systems in which stereo with just plainly have no effect because you're listening to a mono system. For example, a lot of laptop speakers, phone speakers and Bluetooth systems have this problem. So what I mean by stereo with is this almost subconscious idea of sounds that are very white, sounding like they're coming from here. Especially when listening on headphones, you may notice this effect. There's sounds that seem to come from here. And then there's sounds that seem to exist like in the middle of your head right here. You can of course play with this effect. You can make sure that a lot of your synth sounds are a little bit wider and that the kick and bass is a little bit more mono so that the kick and bass grabs a little bit more attention like in the middle of your head and the sounds kind of sound like they're pushed off to the side, which essentially is what stereo with is. So here in the kick and bass, let's have a look at what that means in terms of stereo separation. We have this main bass patch over here, which sounds like this. Notice that it feels very, very central sounding. It is not completely central. I do have a little bit of stereo widening on my main bass line as well in this group here. And you see also over here, I'm doing another bit of stereo widening, but this is like 95% mono still with the way that I've set it up, especially in the lower frequencies. As you can see, the minimum frequency that is affected by this effect is around 300 Hertz. So especially my sub bass over here is going to be completely mono. But then if we listen to, for example, this layer over here, notice how stereo this is. In fact, if we look over here in this plugin called MSET, you can see that I'm completely muting the mid component or the mono component, meaning that this only has stereo width to it. It does not actually have a mono signal. So this means that this sound is going to sound very, very white. And if you were listening on studio monitors or a good pair of speakers or even headphones, you'll hear that. You will hear that effect of the sound coming from the sides over here as opposed to the center like that other sound was. And this would be the last level of separation. These are the four levels that you can use the, the four kind of main ways that you can separate sounds and make them sound like distinct and each give them their own pockets. Now I don't want you to go overboard with this. It's not going to be like, okay, the kick and bass is going to go from the lowest frequencies up until like 250 Hertz. I'll hard filter it out there and then I'll have my synths in the next section and then I'll have my hats in the next section. It's not going to be that kind of separation. You don't have to make sure that it's, there's no overlap whatsoever. In fact, what I would argue is that the best sound is usually achieved by not getting one level of separation and making it like totally separate, but instead using a little bit of each of the levels of separation. So you might use a little bit of frequency separation. The kick drum still has a high transient that sits in the high frequencies, but most of its energy is going to be in the lower frequencies. Same is true for the baseline. If we actually look at where the frequencies lie, you can see that it kind of goes up all the way up until 10K here. But you can clearly see that most of the energy is going to be down below over here. The same is going to be true for level and stereo width. Of course, it's not going to sound good if you turn one level all the way down to minus infinity, because then you won't hear the sound. It will be perfectly separated, of course, but you won't hear it. So at that point, what's the point? The same is true for the stereo width. Usually it doesn't sound good having a completely side signal, like a signal that doesn't have any mono component, especially because you won't be able to hear that on the mono system. The side signals will cancel each other out and the sound will no longer exist in the mono version of your track. The other mixing thing that I often see kind of like in the same thing with the mixing for purpose as opposed to mixing for tricks is that people just kind of do things. So for example, a high pass on the master or a high pass on stuff like the kick and bass, all of that kind of stuff can really ruin your mix without you actually knowing why. There are many, many videos here on YouTube discussing the pros and the cons of using a high pass either on the master or on individual elements. Some people are completely against it. Some people are completely for it. I land personally a little bit in the middle. And my main opinion in that regard is that when it comes to the high pass, you need to have a purpose for the high pass to be there. Otherwise, if you just throw it on there without it having a purpose, it's probably going to cause more negative effects than positive ones. And this will be true for any kind of process that you may have for mixing purposes. You have to take into account all of the positives that you're going to get from a particular plugin, from a particular effect. Maybe you're adding a little bit of reverb to a sound. You have to take into account, okay, it's going to put this sound in a room, which I like, and it's going to muddy up my mix a little bit because there's now reverb in my mix. You then have to balance this positive and negative effect. Okay, how much room do I want? How much room is maybe too much room? How much of this room effect is going to make it so that my mix really muddies up? And maybe at that point I should dial it back a little bit so I don't get too much muddiness in the mix, but I still get a little bit of room effect, even though a little bit more reverb sounds maybe better on its own. 
in the context of the mix, it's going to sound muddy and it's going to sound like very washed out. And it might be really hard to hear the elements in the whole context of the track. So those are the kinds of decisions that you need to make when you're mixing. It doesn't really matter, as I said at the beginning of like this, this little segment on mixing, I guess. It doesn't matter exactly what compressor you're using, exactly what your release time is. Once the overall picture is completed, then you can start to worry about that on maybe some of the more important elements. But the main overall cohesion of the track has to come before all of the little tricks that you apply and all of the little things that you may have learned on YouTube, all of the, the, the cool, interesting plugins that you found, all of that stuff really has to take a backseat to the overall mixing picture that you're trying to create for the track. One of the elements that I want to take a little bit more of a closer look at are going to be vocals. The reason for that is vocals are very important in the story of the track, especially the spoken vocals. And what I hear a lot is producers not giving their vocals enough space to actually tell you the story that they're trying to tell. So for example, over here, this is a great example. Look at how much space this vocal has over here. We have looked at this vocal in a prior video as well, in terms of the way that it sits, in terms of the rhythm and stuff like that. But now let's just have a look at the space that it has. So this is the vocal line over here. I'll tell you what I know. And you'll notice that around it, there's a lot of stuff going on. Over here, you can see a whole bunch of different elements. Over here, you can see one of those main sequences that we had to look at before. But in this segment over here, it's really just competing with one other element. I'll tell you what I know. So you can hear there's not really much going on. There's not really much that the vocal has to compete with. Every vocal that I put in my track already in the production gets a lot of space for it just to sit in the track and just to work. I just quickly want to show you an example of where it would probably not be a good idea to have vocals. As you can see here, we have like one of these digital voices over here. Sounds like this. It's already a little bit hard to hear because of the effects, but you can almost hear what it's trying to say. It says the phrase, we are the world. But in the mix, as it currently stands, with all of the other elements going on, you really cannot hear what it's trying to tell you. So in this case, what I would probably do is just completely scrap this vocal idea for here because there's not enough space for it to actually exist within this part of the track. And I hear this a lot in beginner tracks where beginners at the height of their track, when they have a lot of different elements going on, they want to try to squeeze in a vocal. And a vocal really doesn't work like that. A vocal, as I said, needs a lot of space because we need to be able to hear what it's trying to say. In fact, there's a little bit of psychology going on in that we naturally try to focus on vocals when we hear them in music because it's a human voice that is something that we're familiar with. So when we're just listening to a track, we're just trying to naturally understand whatever voice that is telling us something. And if the mix doesn't allow for that, we kind of get stressed out. Now, now in Sightrans in particular, there's a lot of vocals that are like glitched up and stuff like that that don't really contribute to the story. But they have still have the same problem because our mind needs to be able to decide to ignore those sounds. If we have one of those these glitchy vocals that don't really add to the story of the track, we still want to be able to hear the fact that it doesn't add to the story of the track. Because otherwise we're still going to try to focus on it and see if we can decipher what the vocal is actually saying. Now again, just with the structuring of the track, I want you to keep in mind that the listener does not have the luxury of having your whole project. What we did before is actually a really bad thing to judge whether a vocal is going to sound good within a part of the track. Because what we did is we listened to it solo, we heard what it said. And now once we know what the vocal sounds like, what it is actually saying, what we can do is we can actually hear it better in the track than if we didn't know what the vocal was saying. Now the final thing that I want to talk about is an undefined flow. Now this is a little bit more of a production thing, but I originally had a point about mastering here. I do however think that this point is a little bit more important than the point that I was going to make about mastering. And maybe I'll tackle that separate point of mastering in a separate video. For now though, let's talk a little bit about flow. What I mean by that is together all of your elements are trying to convey like one message. And what I often hear is that one element has a particular kind of flow to it, a particular kind of cadence to it. For example, let's take this element over here. You can see that this has a rising flow to it. It's going up, it's becoming bigger, it's becoming higher.
as you can hear, it's just continuously rising and increasing in energy level. It's just kind of hyping up what the listener is listening to, as you can imagine. What I sometimes hear beginners do is that they'll take an element like this and layer it on a place that doesn't really require any increase in energy. So for example, let's take this element over here and let's just move it a little bit earlier in the track. What I sometimes hear is that beginners would do something like this, where the first part of the drop, this part where the track actually starts like playing the kick and bass fully, immediately has maybe like a rising element on top of it, or it has like a very big synth or something very energetic. It doesn't really make sense with the actual flow of the track. If we think about the flow of the track, we can see that in the drums. We can see that the energy of the drums is constantly increasing. Especially if I open it up like this, you can see each individual element. We start with no drums whatsoever on the kick and bass. This part is actually filtered, so you can ignore that. The kick and bass starts here to play. This is where the drop starts. We start with no drums whatsoever. And slowly it increases, increases over time, increases even more until we get into this high energetic part over here. And this is where your main high energy synth should be. It should not be that the kick and bass just plays on its own and that there's this massive big energy synth on top of it because it's not going to make sense with the rest of the track. The flow is going to sound off. So just as an example so that you can hear, let's have a listen to the flow of this part of the track now. So just as an example, let's play this part of the track with that element in there so you can hear how it is standing out and it doesn't really work with this part of the track. So you can hear immediately when it comes in, it's just kind of abrupt. First of all, we're not introducing the element. We're not letting the listener know, hey, this element is about to come in here. But it also just doesn't work with the energy level of the track itself. The rest of the track is very like mellow here and it's still very slow. There's a few one shots playing every once in a while and we don't really have an aggressive sequence yet because we're building up to that over time. The aggressive sequences are going to start to play here and maybe this is a little bit more aggressive, but. The main stuff is happening over here, where there's like vocal sequences and big brass steps and stuff like that. And you can hear that there's also a lot more going on in terms of the top drums. So this would be a much better spot to put an element like that. The other thing that you'll notice in this element is that the ending doesn't really match with the rest of the elements. Now, the reason for that is because I copied it from uh, over here. And the way that this fill works is that it's a four bar fill, as you can see, but it's actually broken up into segments of two bars. So this is the first segment of the fill and this is the second segment of the fill. And even this one is again, like cut up in two segments here. Again, a little bit of a throwback to earlier in the video. This is done through the division rule, but you can hear how this fill actually works and how it actually sits in the track. What you'll hear is that everything is building up to this point over here, to this 215 bar here, which is crucially two bars before the kick and bass comes back in. So there's two more bars where we're kind of going lower again and we're transitioning. Whereas over here, the transition only happens in one bar. So it sounds like this element just kind of comes in with the transition one bar earlier than all of the other elements. This element over here is rising, rising, rising up until this point over here, while all of the other elements are rising to this point up over here. So when it comes to your flow of the track, what you want to do is you want to make sure that all of the elements that sit in a particular part of the track kind of contribute to the same flow. Again, to show you this part of the example over here, this element is rising up to this point over here. This element over here, as you can see from the automation, is rising to this point over here. We have another element over here, which is rising up exactly to this point over here. You can just see that in the waveform here. All of those elements are working together to rise up to a certain point, and therefore they're all contributing to the same flow. And if you don't do that kind of thing, your track is not going to sound as unified as it could be. So that's going to be it. That's all of the things that I wanted to talk about in today's video. I hope that this video is helpful for you. 
as you can imagine with this kind of top 10 video where you're talking about 10 different subjects in essence, I cannot go too much in depth on one particular subject. So if you want that, make sure that you comment down below which subject I should cover more. But that's going to be it for today. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you want to support the channel and you want to see this channel grow, the best way to do that is by watching more of my content. So there should be two videos up on the screen right now. Just choose one of them and enjoy it. So that's the video. I hope to see you in the next one. Bye bye.